This talk is brought to you by the Thomistic Institute. For more talks like this, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. It's important to realize from St. Thomas's perspective that the human person has virtue. The human person needs virtue. Because the human person is not God, first and foremost. The human person is a creature. And it's because he's a creature and not God participates in God's being that the human creature needs virtue. Said another way, God has no virtue. (laughs) That might be an interesting thing to, to ponder or a strange thing to hear. God is not virtuous. Why? Well, because God doesn't need virtue. The perfection of his being transcends virtue. God is good because it's of his very essence, as we say, as Thomas say, to be. To be God is simply to be perfectly, purely, with no potency, no imperfection, no need for change. In God, there is no before and after. In God, there is no better or worse. In God, there is only deity, pure and perfect act, whose nature simply is to be. As St. Thomas says, God's essence is his existence. God's to be is simply to be. Uncreated, eternal. We have no idea what that's like. We have no experience of that. We can name it. We can describe it. But we have absolutely no experience. We can't describe experientially what it is to be God or what it is to be in the way that God is. We know how we are. We know what it is for us to be. By contrast, in us, in creatures, every creature, essence and existence are distinct. And the created realm to be is not simply to be, but to be something. To be in creation is to be a rock, to be a tree, to be a horse, to be a man, to be an angel. Creatures participate in God's being as some kind of thing with a nature, which determines not only how they participate in God's being as a plant, as a bird, as a man, but also what kind of perfection the thing will have as a plant, as a bird, as a man. Now it's plain from ordinary experience that no creature comes into existence in a state of fulfillment. Oak trees don't appear out of thin air. They begin as an acorn and then they grow into saplings and after years grow to the full maturity of the trees that we admire. And even after they reach maturity, created things can achieve further perfection. So it's not just their material perfection in terms of age and growth and development. There are other kinds of perfections that they can achieve. They become really good as all of their potencies, all of the potencies of their nature are perfected. For an example, an adult oak tree can be a bad tree. How? Well, it can be diseased. It can suffer from a shortage of water or sunlight. It might be under a power line and have its branches cut by the city every five years, making it ugly, misshapen. Creatures are perfected They become fulfilled. They become happy. As the potencies of their natures, how it is that they participate in God's being, are fulfilled. And it's important to realize, important to make all these proper distinctions. Dogs fulfill their natures differently from fish. Dogs have a different kind of happiness than fish. If you try to make a dog happy in the way that fish are happy, you will have a very unhappy and very likely dead dog. 
Now, all this is a prelude to articulating a truth that Aristotle observed millennia ago. All things desire their good insofar as they desire their own perfection. So because every created thing in its participation in God is on a journey, for lack of a better term, a pilgrimage, we say, in the Christian tradition, everything that comes into be is good insofar as it is, but has the capacity and potency to achieve even greater goodness insofar as it achieves the perfection of its own nature by actualizing all the potencies of its nature. And you can articulate this and work this out with every kind and every class of creature. It applies to each one and to each kind. Tonight we'll talk specifically about the human creature and human happiness. But in terms of understanding why there's such a thing as virtue and how it is that virtue leads to goodness and to happiness is to have this principle in mind. Every created thing is good insofar as it is, but it can also become better as it perfects all of the capacities and potencies of its nature. Now, when you look at the whole of the created realm, we see that plants, lower animals, even higher animals, those that have sense, those that don't have sense, you see that within the created realm, excluding men, human beings, and angels, most achieve the good of their nature and the excellence of their nature, we say by instinct. What it takes for a bird, for example, to emerge from an egg and become later on a parent of other birds, birds don't think about it all that much. Birds don't reflect on all of the various possibilities they have. They don't choose necessarily where to live. They're not thinking about, you know, all of the potential mates they could have and choosing the right one. It just, by instinct, it happens. There is a kind of deliberation that takes place in animals because we can see that they do match means to ends and that's a rational activity. It's like they make choices. They know that the bird knows it needs to build a nest. Well, it kind of knows where to go and what sticks and what straw to pick up to construct that nest. So it is matching means to ends, but without deliberation, without its own reflection, without making choices, without commanding its own actions. Aquinas looks at that mystery and says, It's important to note that that rational activity inscribed in the natures of animals such that they act by instinct, that's a reflection of the divine reason that we see within animals because there's, they act rationally without thinking rationally themselves. They're attracted to the good without, we would say, choosing to love themselves. Somebody's thinking, somebody's loving for them, and that knowing and that loving is inscribed in their nature such they act on it by instinct, but it's, it's not their own reason and it's not their own will active there, but rather God's. We stand out in that regard, and that's for Aquinas what makes the human creature and by extension the angels so marvelous and so magnificent. Insofar as all things desire their good, insofar as they desire their own perfection, and by nature, most things habitually and without their own deliberation, without their own choice, achieve that good, we're different. Desire in us looks different. And for that reason, the way we, pr we pursue and enjoy the goods that perfect our nature look different. We do know in reason 
and deliberate, make judgments and command our actions. We do, we are stirred, not just by desire and passion, but also by love and friendship. And that's by our own choice. So when we look at the whole of creation and see that all things move by desire to the achievement of their perfection, by instinct, we perform that same act and undergo that same drama, but differently, by our own reason, by our own will, by intellect, by volition, by knowledge, and by love. So those are the two, in the human person, that in a sense, the two engines by which we not only recognize what's good for us, but then love and pursue what is good for us, which makes us good by knowledge and by love, by intellect and by will. Now, it's not enough simply to be able to know and to be able to love that puts us on the path to perfection, to maturity, to happiness. But the whole tradition recognizes, and Aquinas here only repeats what he inherits, our powers of knowing and loving themselves have to be perfected. They have to be good at knowing, good at loving, so that when we do seek to know the good and when we seek to love the good, those powers of knowing and loving themselves are operating in a good, stable, and trustworthy way so that we see and know clearly and love rightly and purely. And that's the work of the virtues. That's where the virtues come into the picture. We'll take a break here just in terms of the talk. Everything that has come up to now uh, is what metaphysicians like and moral the theologians don't like. <laughs> it's the more speculative part of the talk as opposed to the more practical we'll move into now. From here on out, it's what the metaphysicians tend not to like because it's boring. But for moral theologians and moral philosophers, it's more, more exciting because it's more hands-on and technical and practical. So we'll move you know, from the more speculative metaphysical more to the the practical, anthropological here. And for that, I'm gonna use the board because I think it's better to, to sketch these things out. I am no Picasso, so don't uh, laugh at my, my stick figure here, but you just need to, the image of the human person, called Imago, the Imago Dei, the image of God that every human person is. And again, he's got three, well, two principal powers by which he comes to know and to love the goods that perfect him in his nature as a rational animal. Intellect, and the appetite that extends from intellect, which we call the rational appetite. That's the technical fancy word for the will. But there's also in us passion, technical term, the sense appetites. This is the appetite that moves in us that follows upon sense knowledge. So just basic knowledge that, of things that we gather through our senses tends to stir our gut, our passions, higher forms of knowledge that we grasp more abstractly and intellectually, that's what moves the appetite in the will. So intellect, will, passion, intellect, rational appetite, sense appetite. Intellect is that power by which we draw all of reality into ourselves so that we, in a sense, as Aristotle says, possess it intellectually. Aristotle has this great line that says that the human person really can become all things because he holds all things within himself. Every form or the forms of all things we can possess intellectually such that not only do we hold all of reality in ourselves, ourselves as we become all reality by that intellectual act. So intellect is that power by which we draw all things into our knowledge and possess them intellectually. Appetite has the exact opposite movement. If intellect is that power by which we draw all of reality in ourselves to be known and understood by us, Appetite is that power that propels us out into the world to actually grab reality, to grab and embrace the good, to enjoy the good. 
And it's through that possession and enjoyment of goods, real goods, in the world that the capacities of our nature, our potencies as human beings, are satisfied and fulfilled. So what are some of those goods then? What are the goods that perfect and satisfy human need, human potency? Well, first of all, we're going to draw a few of them. It's important for the human creature, first of all, to keep himself alive. Because if he doesn't keep himself alive, well, what's the point? <laughs> He's not going to achieve any higher goods or, as you say, higher potencies if uh, he's sick, weak, malnourished. Among the first and most basic goods that are required for human life, simply in its being sustained, is just food, drink, and shelter. And this is for the survival of the individual. But it's also good for the human individual not only to work for his own survival, but also for the survival of others. And not just those who are closest to him, but all others, which is to say the entire members of the species. Or the entire species itself. So it's the good of generation, which is achieved through the sexual act. For Aquinas and for the Thomas tradition, these are two the most basic goods that the human person achieves because they serve the most basic reality, the survival of the individual, the survival of the species. Anybody notice anything that might connect those two or the pursuit or the enjoyment of those goods? Does the uh, essay from the stick figure man <laughs> equal the... That's the right. Why is that? Because he's got appetite. That's right. So those two goods, yeah, that's what Aquinas, uh, that's good. He would see almost immediately that not so much intellect and not so much will, but the goods that represent food, drink, and shelter, and the good of sex especially, register first and foremost in the sense appetite. Why? Because they have intense pleasure that's attached to the enjoyment of these goods more than any others Aquinas recognizes. And I think if we think about it for two seconds, we'll also see the same thing. That Aquinas says it's a rather kind of marvelous thing when you look around that those goods that require, that are required basically for the simple survival of the human individual and the species have the most intense pleasures attached to them. The pleasure of food, the pleasure of drink, the pleasure of sex. And so as we'll see in a second, the sense appetite is the first to be stirred. The sense passions are the first to be stirred because those goods are felt in the body. In the body itself, it's the body that registers first and foremost desire for those goods. But moving up the chain, as we go up, we move to higher and more sophisticated forms of goods. This is the good of the family. The human creature is not a mere individual tasked with his own survival and serving the survival of the species. The goods necessary for survival are shared and collectively enjoyed in something like the family, between husband and wife, between parents and children, between siblings, in a household. And so the good of the family emerges as a good that's perfective of the human person. And by nature, man, woman, seek to marry, to have families, and as such, associate with other families, which leads us to the next kind of good, the good of the city, which is the foundation of our political life. Now, it may be our experience of politics today that politics is quite unnatural. <laughs> And it can feel that way. But for the ancients, for Aristotle, for St. Thomas, there's nothing more natural for the human person than to live and be part of a family and by extension, part of a city, and more importantly, part of a city and engage in political life as a citizen for most of us. 
and then for some of us as political figures or authority figures. Now the city, for Aquinas, for Aristotle, doesn't represent the highest good. The highest social good, yes, but not the highest good of the human individual because all of us have the capacity to look above our cities, to look up, literally, to see the heavens, the stars, the planets, that there's a whole order to creation that exists and transcends even the highest form of political life, which is the city. And so there's something about the whole cosmos and the contemplation of the entire cosmos that is good for us. So here we begin to see things like philosophy, higher sciences, is becoming perfective of the human person. And that leads to one final one that will suffice for now. Any good higher than the order of the cosmos? Yeah. God. Not God in himself, because God in himself is completely unknowable, but God insofar as that we can know that he exists and that we can ascertain a few of his attribute, attributes by studying the effects of his created work in the cosmos. So by a kind of argument from effect to cause, not only can we conclude that God is, but some of his attributes like he's one, he's simple, he's all-powerful, omniscient. But in this case, it suffices for us to say, God is first cause and final end. So when you look at the human creature, and you can't consider human nature, and what are the goods that are perfective of human nature, of the human being, as a rational animal, as a social animal, as a political animal, we can create, or at least sketch out, this kind of hierarchy. Now, there are a thousand things we can fill in the gaps here, but this just you know, suffices for categorically looking at the kinds of goods that are perfective of human nature. Which is to say, in order to be happy, in order to fulfill, satisfy, the longings of his nature, the needs of his nature, to enjoy these goods so that all of his capacities and potencies can be fulfilled, each and every human creature has to pursue and enjoy in some way this entire hierarchy. It doesn't work to leave one of them out or some of them out. And the purpose of talking about virtue is to help us to see how it is by virtue how virtue equips us, in fact, to pursue this entire hierarchy of good well. But first of all, let's just take a moment to see how it is that through sense appetite, rational appetite, intellect, man is stirred by these goods and moves towards them. So, in union with the whole of the animal kingdom, the human person enjoys the use of sense appetite passions, and it's through those sense appetites in the movement of passion that he's attracted first and foremost to the goods at the bottom of the hierarchy, those goods whose pleasure is enjoyed specifically in the body. And again, the good of food, the good of drink, the good of sex. And it's by the enjoyment of these goods, not only does the individual keep himself alive, but also promotes the generation of the species, which is a pretty big good. So already we can begin to see I mean, how social the human individual is, and this goes against a lot of what we just imbibe in, in the culture. I mean, there's just rank individualism. We're all formed to think that we are, in fact, just soul islands, monads, just floating through the cosmos, not having, to do with anything, having anything to do with each other or others. But the ancients saw right away that even in our, I don't want to say base, because you don't want to say that, but even in our kind of lower sense life, we are oriented to a perfection that makes sure that there are other people in the world. And that it's good for us to make sure that we act in such a way to bring new life and others into the world in order to share life with them. And this is an important one. 
And again, for the tradition, it makes sense then that such intense pleasure is attached to the act of bringing other people into the world, such that there's not a whole lot of thought that has to go into it. <laughs> One of my professors used to say, if sex were like algebra, you know, none of us would be here. <laughs> but it's true, it's true. But there are higher goods. Goods that we don't recognize simply through the senses of sight, smell, taste, hearing, touch, but that we recognize through intellect. The good of the family is not something we see simply by looking out into the world, but by looking at particular human beings and coming to understand the relations among them and appreciating intellectually the good that they have and share together, the life that they live together. More so with the city and the cosmos. Yeah, at first we might be able to look up and see the starry skies and be moved kind of passionately by the simple sight of the grandeur and immensity of the cosmos, but then to really begin to reflect intellectually what the cosmos is and what our place in it is. That's a much more intellectual act, solely an intellectual act that we achieve through reflection. And certainly, because we have no sense experience of God, even as first cause of final end, that is something that only comes, we come to, a truth we come to, a good we come to only through the working of our intellect. So it's important to see that intellect has this universal scope by knowledge, by understanding, and hopefully developing what we might be able to call wisdom, we see the entire hierarchy of good, understand the entire hierarchy of good. And because we recognize in these things intellectually goods for us, will is moved. The appetite of the will, the appetite of the intellect is moved such that we not only know that these things are good for us, but have active, rational desire for them. So the entire span, the entire hierarchy of the goods that perfect us in our human nature become objects not only of intellect and its universal knowing, but also of will and its capacity to love what it knows, which is to say the whole hierarchy of So hopefully just by sketching this out, it's clearer now how it is by intellect, will, passion, sense appetite, we move towards, we engage the pursuit of the goods that perfect us, come to possess them and enjoy them. Not only individually, but with each other, in the family, in the city, in friendship. So is it kind of clear just in terms of highlighting how it is by intellect, appetite, intellect, will, passion? These are kind of the, the interior engines and motors you know, that, that prompt us, and it's the powers by which we move to perfect our capacities, to pursue those goods that satisfy and fulfill our long. Is that all clear? As I said earlier, it's not sufficient, though, just that we have intellect and appetite, that we have intellect, will, and passion. Because these things, these powers, have their own motion to them, have their own movement that's proper to them. So the proper action of intellect is knowing the truth. The proper act of Will is loving the good, the proper act of sense appetite is desiring what is pleasurable. Those acts themselves and those movements with, of these powers themselves are subject to perfection. Because we all know by experience, especially, that intellect, will, and appetite can fail, right? We make a wrong judgment. 
about the truthfulness of some proposition. The moon is made of cheese. We've heard it said. Oh yeah, that sounds right. That's a failure <laughs> in our own reasoning. We don't draw reality into ourselves when we make when we affirm that proposition. Because in fact, the moon is not made out of cheese. Not heard. Will, gosh, I mean, how many times? I mean, just thinking of what Saint Paul has to say in one of his letters. I mean, about you know failing to do the good he wants to do, and only doing you know the evil that that he hates. I mean, that's a universal experience. And sense appetites. I mean. Being hungry when we don't need to eat. And just the whole world of the, the sexual confusion that our culture finds itself in. And that, that's just all testimony and just kind of the wayward movement of, of, of sensual appetite. So these powers themselves are subject to perfections. And we call those <clears throat> virtues which are stable habits that in these powers to make sure that in their own movements of knowing, willing, and desiring, they know the truth, they will the good, and they desire the pleasurable rightly, according to right reason. And this is how we can then begin to distinguish the virtues by which powers they perfect in us. So on the one hand, there are there is a set of intellectual virtues. We tend not to talk about them all that much, and even in the title of tonight's talk, we're more interested in the moral virtues, but it is important to understand even what the moral virtues do, to understand that there are intellectual virtues. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. These are the intellectual virtues, the virtues that perfect the movement and operation of intellect. But the virtue of knowledge that equips us to rightly, basically form science, to kind of collect our knowledge of individual things and individual facts and begin to associate them one to another properly into bodies of knowledge. Understanding is that virtue of the intellect by which, by the light of reason, we can penetrate through the surface of things into their inner natures and understand them individually more abstractly, but to understand more their essence or nature. It's like getting to the unseen reality of things. It's like it's going deeper than just the surface of a thing to its real inner intelligibility. It's not just seeing a dog, but understanding what the dog is. Not just experiencing a birthday party, but knowing like what a birthday party is for. And then wisdom is a higher form of understanding, whereas we're not just penetrating into the kind of interior intellig intelligibility of things, but really trying to understand them according to their highest causes. Just trying to glimpse the whole of reality from its highest viewpoint. It is sense from God's view. So wisdom, knowledge, understanding, knowledge, three virtues that perfect the operation of the will. Then we get into the moral virtues. So these, these virtues, perfect our speculative life. The next four we'll talk about perfect our practical life, the moral life, the life of action. The first of these is prudence. And even though prudence is a moral virtue, it has its seat in the intellect. Because whereas wisdom and understanding and knowledge perfect our reasoning about things to know for their own sake, prudence is the perfection of our intellect in its reasoning about the things we have to do. Action. We set an end for ourselves, some kind of goal, and therefore we have to begin to deliberate about the possible means to achieving that goal. We have to make a judgment about the best of those means that are possible to us, and then make a command. We have to command ourselves to actually execute the means to the end that we've determined and judged to be most appropriate in these circumstances. That's all the work of prudence, and it all takes place in the intellect. Justice is the moral virtue that perfects the will. Justice establishes in our will a stable disposition always and everywhere to render the, uh, render the others due. Every word of that definition of justice is important because there are very few people popularly today hold to it anymore. Why? Well, if 
you look around and look about, watch the news for about three minutes, you begin to see that justice for most people is not about rendering the other his due, but standing up and making just claims for myself. So justice is first and foremost getting what is mine. <laughs> and if we all do that, then we'll all kind of get ours together. But it's very individualistic. It's concerned first and foremost with me. The classical sense of justice is the exact opposite. It's much more important for the individual to make sure that the other receives his due, and in so doing, secures his own good. Why? Because we're inherently social. We're inherently political. Each of us finds himself within a family. Each of us finds him or herself within a city. And in order to live rationally and sanely and happily in those communities, I act first and foremost to make sure that the family itself and the city itself flourishes insofar as I can support and sustain the lives of the others in the family and in the city. And by rendering the other his due, and making sure that the family and the city continue in good order, then I find myself in the right situation in order to pursue my own good. But that can only follow upon justice about rendering and securing the good for the other first and foremost. Not to the neglect of my own good, always. But pursuing my own individual good in such a way that the other is also secure in his or her good. Each of these virtues we'll talk about, I mean, just briefly, just name them, and we can spend a whole semester on them, just unpack. But we're just giving you the cliff notes tonight. Next, courage, or fortitude. Courage is the perfection of the passion, of the gut, and it's one of two, the other is temperance. So why is it that in the moral life, the intellect gets just one virtue, will gets one virtue, those seem to be the higher powers, therefore you think their perfection would be more complicated. Uh, it's not, actually. Uh, we need two moral virtues for our passions and for our sense appetites, because in our sense appetites, in our passions, we have two basic movements. And each virtue perfects one of those two movements. First, in our sense appetite, there's the movement of fear when we're put in danger. So it's the fear of hardship, the fear of difficulty, the fear of harm, the fear of death. And there's some danger that we incur, that we encounter. Fear is stirred in us. Courage is that virtue which makes sure that, yes, fear is stirred, but not to the degree where it would override the pursuit of justice or prudence that's still required in that moment. So just make courage make sure that we feel fear in a rational way and not in an irrational way. Courage ensures that we don't allow fear to cause us to abandon or run away from the pursuit of the good when unnecessary, when reason would in fact demand that we persevere in the pursuit of that good. And we see this first and foremost in the soldier. The whole tradition has always seen the person of the soldier who, faced with the prospect of risking his own life for the sake of the city, pursues the preservation of the city, even at putting at risk his own life, and not allowing the fear of death to cause him to abandon that mission of that good. Temperance works in the sense appetite, but not on the emotion of fear, but on the emotion of desire for pleasure. So when, when we come up to, when we encounter some kind of physical danger, we experience fear. When we encounter something that promises physical pleasure, desire, what we call concupiscence, is stirred in us. And temperance is that virtue that doesn't, again, quash desire, quash cupiscence, no more than courage quashes fear, but make sure that we experience the desire for that pleasure in a way that doesn't prompt us to abandon the reasonable pursuit of the good. 
In other words, temperance allows us to desire the pleasurable good, but in a way that accords with reason. To desire the kinds of food, drink, and shelter, the kinds of sexual relations that are appropriate to us in our circumstances that will actually benefit us and not in some way hurt us. In terms of overindulging in food or drink, engaging in sexual relations outside of the covenant of marriage. Or, Aquinas would also say, temperance has the effect, too, of making sure that we have enough desire for these pleasures. It is possible, less common, but it is possible not to desire these pleasures enough, and that itself is a kind of weakness or deficit. And temperance could make sure that we have enough in a sense, passion for these goods. So this, for Aquinas, is how we begin to make sense of the virtues and why we talk about the virtues. And it's important, and this will be the last point I'll make before we can open to questions, is that <clears throat> these aren't simply instrumental goods that we acquire simply to make sure that we get the goods of life more easily and more quickly, although virtue does help us to do that. That's one of the effects of virtue. Prudence, justice, courage, and temperance. It makes the pursuit and the enjoyment of these goods quick, prompt, easy, and joyful. But first and foremost, to answer the question in the title of tonight's talk, because the virtues, first and foremost, have the effect but perfecting the movement of intellect, perfecting the movements of will, perfecting the movements of our appetites, it's in that regard that the virtues make us good. This is the picture of a good human being, one who has the movements of intellect, will, and appetite so regulated and ordered by the virtues. Just so that there are no mistakes in the movements of these powers. But they're actually moving and operating, running in a sense, at their full capacity, proper capacity. So that intellect is only inclined and attaches to truth. That will inclines to desires and attaches only to the good. And the sense appetites incline us to the enjoyment of only those pleasures that lead in our own circumstances to a proper, to the proper good. So it's here that intellectually, but also the moral virtues especially, not only propel us to the good, but in pursuing the good, make us good at the same time. And more importantly, because the thing is, it's more important that our operation the operations of our powers unfold virtuously because we can still fail to achieve these and still remain good and virtuous. And that's a consoling and important thing to remember. So that was a lot of information. Something in class at the House of Studies I usually take two weeks to cover. We did it in about 50 minutes. <laughs> But I think it's important to have this sketch. And if there's nothing else you remember tonight, but just kind of remember how these concepts and terms are fit together, uh, you'll gain a lot from further reflection and just seeing how all of these parts fit together. The Imago Dei, the goods that perfect our nature, the powers by which we pursue those goods, and then the virtues of habits and perfections that render us good by rendering good the operations of, of intellect and appetite in this. All right, I'll stop there. There was already one question, but I'm sure there are more. So thank you. For those who can't quite reach that intellectual mm -hmm. capability that right. just can't, like, uh, um, what is like? What is there to do? I guess mm -hmm. the main goal 
is to teach as much people as we can right. all of this so that they can kind of come to their conclusion. Like, I had a, I have an astrophysicist cousin who, uh -huh. she was like super atheist, and then the higher she got into her knowledge and learning, she became Catholic. Okay. And, um, yes, but like for people that like can't quite come to those right. intellectual conclusions, mm -hmm. what is the case yeah. for them? Yeah. Again, we can have a a hyper individualized right regard for perfection, mm -hmm. so that we can think that um, that each and every person, in order to be happy, has to be absolutely perfect in the pursuit and possession of all of these goods to the same degree, which is to say, to the maximal degree. Mm -hmm. That's not true. <laughs> That's not true for a couple of reasons. One. Uh, we don't all possess, let's say, the power of intellect and the power of will. We all possess intellect and will, but to varying degrees of power. I mean, some of us are just smarter than others. And that's not through anyone's fault. That's just how we experience ourselves and how we kind of appear in the world. For some, the light of reason just penetrates more quickly and more surely into things where they just see things more quickly. You know, they can grasp things more intuitively, where for others, it might take them 10 years <laughs> to work on a particular problem before they finally get it. You know? Even Aristotle thought that even though this is perfective, knowledge of God is first in, first cause and final end of all things, he probably thought maybe one or two people ever <laughs> had achieved it, himself being one. <laughs> I said that kind of jokingly, but they all knew. I mean, they, they knew this is very difficult uh, to achieve. And very few actually see this by way of demonstration. The rest of us believe it, you know, to be true. Uh, but, uh, but very few of us can see it. So that's okay. So we, we, we see that people possess kind of the, the, the intellectual, volitional, even sensibilities to, to varying degrees. Uh, but that's just accidental you know, to human identity and human dignity. What makes us human beings is the possession of intellect, the possession of will, the possession of sense appetite. Uh, and regardless of their strength or weakness, we're still a human being. And it also points to the social quality of, of, of human beings in human life, that we bear each other's burdens, you know. The, the strengths of one, you know, supply for the weaknesses of another. You know, the weaknesses of one become opportunities for those with more to share. Uh, and Aquinas is quite clear in that, uh, just in the example you use about teachers. But then those with greater intellects uh, have more of an obligation, not only to know things more clearly, but then to share their knowledge with others. Yeah. And so does this situation apply to, like, say, um, like native tribe that's never like in the middle of Africa or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Because like I've had like discussion with people and you know, like, well, did they go to heaven or hell? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, right. Well, right. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean when uh, Europeans left, you know, Europe started crossing the Atlantic and the Pacific and were finding new people everywhere, this was a fundamental discussion and debate that they had. I mean these new people that were discovering uh are they this kind of creature? You know, uh, some said yes, some said no. Uh, of course, we know now, but yes, I mean that was the answer. Dominicans were quite involved in that, especially in the North. I mean, in the Americas, we have some of our uh, kind of great intellectualites who who fought uh, fiercely, you know, for the public recognition of you know the human quality of, of the native peoples of of, of the Americas. Uh, because they could see that even though the way they exercised reason and will didn't look exactly the way we would expect, uh, they still recognized the, the movements of those powers in, in native peoples. That they could think abstractly, make, cho make rational choices. Uh, and, uh, and because they were priests, I mean, we tip them off first that when they hear the gospel preached, they believe. <laughs> they, they confessed and asked for baptism. Uh, which many of them did. So, and it's also the case that because the working of these powers of the soul are rooted in organs of the body, 
if the organ of the body is somehow injured or damaged, which then you know, makes the operation of the power more difficult, well, we've got ways based on this to explain that too. You know. uh, so we can see that sometimes that maybe uh, to a greater degree, uh, that it's, it's in fact physical differences among people that that can, can lead to, um, to, to a, a variety or, or, or difference in the, uh, the, the, the exercise of, um, of these powers. But again, that just from the Thomas perspective puts the onus on the intelligent and the healthy to put themselves at the service of you know, those who, who have more difficulty in, in, in exercising in these problems. Thank you. Yeah. I have two questions. Sure. Um, one is a little bit off topic. Okay. Um, How about we take the on topic one first? On topic one? Um, the on topic one is uh, what does it look like in when you're focused on God as the first cause? Uh huh. And find out Right. What does that look like? Sure. Are you there? Or like, how does that work out? Because God in himself can't be seen, he can't be touched, he can't be heard, smelled, there's nothing material uh, about God in himself, nor does he make up any part of the cosmos. He's completely transcendent as the creator of all things. He who is perfect act, everything in the cosmos has is created, which means it participates in, in, in God's own being, which is to say it, it has been borrowed from God. You know, God is completely transcendent. And what we know of him here, it's basically uh, anonymous. God remains anonymous in the sense of we know that he is without seeing him. We know that he's the first cause without really seeing him make anything because that all took place <laughs> You know, in terms of the Big Bang or whatever, a long time ago. We also don't see how it is that God sustains everything uh, in being. And because we're not there yet in terms of the cosmos reaching its perfection and completion, uh, we know that God must, as the first cause, must be the final end. But we don't have any experience of any of this. So these are all kind of philosophical conclusions. You know, it's the work of metaphysics that gets us here. So it's like knowing about someone without ever meeting them. You know, uh, and that's what our knowledge of God as first cause and final end is. The good news is that that's not the good news. <laughs> that's not the gospel. What does the gospel teach? God became incarnate. God became incarnate. And because of that, <laughs> in his humanity. But what the Incarnation does in Christ is reveals to us a whole lot about God's own inner life, such that we, on the face of Christ, on his human face, begin to see something of the reflections of the Trinity in God, in Christ's preaching, and in his works and miracles, in the Paschal Mystery, the Passion, Death, and Resurrection. God's inner life is revealed to us as a Trinity of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and not just their identity, but also the divine will that God draws us to himself to share in his own intimate life. So if we were going to complete this picture, because we only wanted to talk about the moral virtues tonight, you'd have to lay over this. Let's say that represents the chasm separating you know, the created realm from the uncreated realm. God, as he is in himself, a trinity of persons, himself enters into the world through the incarnation, manifests his identity and will in the Paschal Mystery, and in our incorporation in Christ, in our membership of the body of the church, we're given three more virtues. What are they? Faith, hope, and charity. Faith, hope, and love. And they are virtues just like these. Aquinas recognizes faith for the intellect so that we know not only that God is and that he's the first cause and final end of all things without our ever really seeing or meeting him, but in faith we're drawn into a communion with God himself 
in knowledge, which is to say we know what God knows. God makes us to know what he knows about himself. And in faith, we're united to God through shared knowledge. Knowledge of him and of his plan for our salvation. Will gets two, hope and charity. By hope, I come to love God, not, again, simply anonymously as first cause of my but as he is in himself, as he reveals himself to us, and reveals himself especially as the object of our beatitude. We'll come to be like him because we shall see him as he is. That's long in the future, at the end of this life. So it's something... Our beatitude in God is an object of hope. Charity, too, is a love by which we love God, not just as a good for us, but we can love God in himself as a friend. That we return to him the love that he shares with us in making us friends in a communion of knowledge, as Christ reveals at the Last Supper. You know, no longer do I call you servants Friends. Why? Because I've shared with you everything you know, that the Father uh, uh, basically told you everything that the Father is doing. So by these three virtues, which we receive in baptism, they're infused into the soul, faith for the intellect, hope and charity for the will. We still pursue all of these goods, but in a way that orients us, orients us to a share in God's own inner life, which is the life of heaven, the life of the end, the life of meaning and the sentence. So that kind of, that is the Christian filling out of the simple question of virtue in terms of pursuing and enjoying the goods of nature, just what on the natural level leads us to a certain happiness, not the happiness of beatitude, but the happiness that this world can offer, which is good, but pales in comparison to what, in fact, is offered us by grace in Christ. So in, to answer the question, I mean, what, what are we looking at uh, when we look at God is first cause and find a land. It's like looking at a painting and knowing that someone painted it. Come to a certain knowledge of the painter by just examining you know, the work of art but without ever getting to know him, without ever really speaking to him. But in the Christian life, God has spoken to us and we've heard his voice and we ascend in faith. We share knowledge with God and because of that, also a life of love, hoping to share eternal life with him forever in glory and already living in a, a union of love with him now, which is the life of charity. To love God for God's sake in all things for God's sake, including my neighbor, which is the life of charity. Any other on topic question before we get to the off topic one? All right, yeah. I was wondering if you could say a few more words about um, justice. <laughs> uh, the definition here, uh, justice perfects the will to render the other his due, but uh, I think you were saying not uh, that that incorporates some element of the individual's good right. as well. Right. Uh, and the virtue, in the example you gave for courage, however, uh, you know, we see certain individuals uh, putting the good of others ahead of themselves is supposed to be at the expense of themselves, right? The mm -hmm. of soldier in his life for the, the police. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can reconcile those. Sure. Well, it's in the latter part of the, the question there, but in the example of the soldier, right, which I think is the answer uh, to the whole question. I mean, why is it a perfection for me to make sure that my neighbor has what's due to him uh, well, make sure that he's secure and it's due to him. It's because we share ultimately the same common good. So really what justice has as its object is not just making sure that my neighbor has his individual claims made or fulfilled, but that my neighbor, in fact, has his rightful place 
within the city. So it's got a, a higher, I mean, it's, it's, it's a higher do that, that comes into consideration. So it's to, it's to live in such a way that the pursuit, my pursuit of the good of the city or my participation in political life doesn't unfold in such a way that hinders another from enjoying that same good. But because the good of the city is something that's shared among all the citizens, if some of the citizens, some of the parts of the whole lack proper enjoyment of the whole, well then the whole is weakened. And therefore I as a part of that whole am also weakened. Maybe it's easier to see in the family. You know, let's say husband, wife, they have children, let's say they're all adults, but one of the siblings is alienated from the family. Well, it's not just a question of just making sure that the alienated person is drawn back into the fold out of a simple concern for him. It, there is concern for the whole there, because insofar as one is alienated, the whole is incomplete. And even the family that remains together is still somewhat handicapped, because there's... Um, someone who belongs to them, someone who should be sharing the same good as them, is not. And therefore, the work to reconcile is certainly out of concern individually uh, for the alienated person, but it's also out of concern for the good of the whole, for the health of the whole. Justice has the same kind of dynamic to it. That in rendering the other his due, I'm ensuring that the whole remains as healthy as possible. And that's not good. That's not only good for my neighbor, but that's good for me as a part of the, of the same whole. Does that make, make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it is important to see. I mean, we can sketch this out really quickly. Requires when you talk about justice, there's three species of justice. So the three species of justice, and they all kind of move in different directions. So the first and most important kind of justice in what economics calls general or legal justice, and this is what the individual owes to the political community. It's general justice is a stable disposition in the will of the individual to render the political community its due. It's what the part owes to the whole. The mirror image of general justice is distributive justice. It's what the political community owes to the individual citizen. It's the stable disposition in the will of the political authority to render the citizens their due. It's what the whole owes to the part. Then you have what individuals owe to each other, what parts of the whole owe to each other, and this is community justice. This is usually what we think about when we hear justice. It's making sure that one individual renders to another individual their due. But if we only see justice in those terms, then we'll not see quite what Aquinas means when he wants to define justice as rendering the other as due, but how it is, it's a perfection of the will. It's not only in terms of commutative justice, but in terms of all three together. And seeing that the individual who has to owe the other individual his due, is also on the one hand a recipient of justice from the commu political community and also one who renders justice to the political community. So it's not just mere individual rendering the due to another mere individual, but it's a part of the whole rendering what's due to a part, another part of the same whole. And that's how, for Aquinas, that's what gives justice its, its texture social texture. And why it is, then, because it's one part of the whole rendering another part of the whole is due, which leads to the flourishing of the whole, which means that redounds to the flourishing of, of every part. So it is good for the individual to render another individual is due, ultimately, because that act redounds to the whole of which he's also a recipient or a beneficiary. But again, in our kind of hyper-individualized sense of self and of person, this, that view gets, gets eclipsed. That's harder for us to see. Yeah. I don't understand what you mean regarding 
this and like pay off the side. Mm -hmm. If you take it to like two individuals, right, uh, trying to survive, say they're dying, right. Do I? <laughs> so I you did last two people on Earth. Yes. Yeah. Or, I'm in the time of somebody. Right. Yeah. In order to survive, there's one code. You got to wear the code to survive. Right. Can I kill him. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why would you want to kill him? Because life is sacred. So because life is sacred, then you take the life of another. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure, sure. No, but I mean, it's, it is, sometimes these cases uh, can be illustrative because it helps us, it allows us to, to bring to the fore an important principle. Uh, other times, though, it's really, it's bad kind of philosophy and bad, certainly moral reasoning to start with extreme cases and try to kind of work your way back to, to what's normative. This would be an extreme case. But what I would say though, but to flesh out, uh, this would still obtain, even if it's two isolated individuals somewhere, because why? Because you each came from a family and still belong to a family. You know? <laughs> and you each still belong to a political community, even though that might be mitigated because you're out in the middle of nowhere and you don't have real connection to the pollution, but still potentially you're still parts of, of that greater whole. So there's never, and this is important for Aquinas, it's important for the ancient tradition, there's, there's no historical moment where the mere individual exists. So there's no historical moment when mere individuals ever meet. What you get always and everywhere are Individuals who are parts of greater wholes, parts of their families, parts of the city. If they're of the same family, that means they share the same family good. If they're of the same city, that means they share the same political good. Uh, and that unites them even before they begin to meet, even, or begin to talk to each other. So the ancients and the medievals had a much better sense of this, uh, a kind of a, a historical sense of the human is individual as social and as political in a way that, that we don't today. Well, I wouldn't say it was tribal. It's quite, I mean, the Roman Empire was, <laughs> you know. No. Well, and that should lead us to make certain judgments about <laughs> that, that kind of activity. Yeah, yeah. Questions. Mm -hmm. That was a... Prudence, justice, courage, temperance. Before Adam and Eve were to fall, mm -hmm. would they have known that? Yep. Like, or would it be almost like the whole God example, where he, he would say he's virtuous, he just is virtuous? No, I mean, uh, because, I mean, this, you could just kind of bracket this. This would still be the picture of man and woman in the state of original justice. They'd still be creatures. They'd still be part of creation. They'd occupy some part of the cosmos. And because they enjoyed uh, the grace of original friendship with God, there would still be something uh, that's not, we, don't, we shouldn't equate that with the beatific vision, which we'll enjoy forever you know, in glory. There was still something propodutic about life in paradise that was meant to prepare Adam and Eve for the life of glory. So they, the life would have looked like ours uh, with the need to exercise, I mean, to make decisions about their actions, <laughs> to love the good rightly, to desire the right pleasures according to right reason, uh, and also, I mean, to develop the speculative life too according to the intellectual virtues. Now this would have been easier, you might say, uh, in friendship with God. Easier because in the grace of friendship, intellect, will, and appetite cooperated with each other in a way that we don't experience in sin. Yeah, I guess it's the cooperation that's yeah. so right. confusing. Because like you, we really experience <laughs> a separation there. Yeah. Because outside of the grace of original justice, which Aquinas says is a grace that, in a sense, it was a grace of integrity. It kind of held us together. You know, to love God right to love anything rightly, will, especially God, has an ordering quality you know, to the soul, such that you, know, you look upon that which you love rightly, 
and you seek pleasure according to what you love, rightly, uh, but without the heart fixed in friendship with God, uh, intellect is dark and, and the appetites just you know wander where they where they will. That's and that's our experience of, of the fall. So I feel like in the Garden of Paradise we had that perfect externalization towards God, mm -hmm. and therefore society would be um, and sin comes along and like almost make makes man makes the sexual aware of himself. So instead mm -hmm. of perfectly externalizing, yeah. Like we internalize, then externalize. Right. I don't know if uh, I would put it that way. Um, because what I would want to say that in the grace of original justice, to put it in those terms, you would have the right kind of balance and the right kind of meaning of the external and the internal. And it would kind of be transcendent to the world, I mean, uh, transparent to the world around. Such that, I mean, how he saw things to be would be exactly the way appetite would move towards them. You know, uh, so that he'd have reflected within his appetite, in fact, the way things are in reality. Uh, because he would see them clearly and then love them justly and rightly, as they are not how he would wish them to be in a disordered kind of way, but in fact how God has established them to be for his good. And that, that would be his participation in, in providence. That reflective part, like without sin, I mean, where's, where's the reflection going? He holds within the movement of appetite he loves things as they are. It's in the reflection of appetite, not to, uh, this It's is the, the reflection of reality within his appetite. Yeah. So as he knows things to be, as he draws them into himself, intellectually, he goes out to them to love them as they are in themselves. And that movement of, of appetite um, finds out in the world exactly, you know, he finds the word exactly how he loves it, <laughs> which is to say, as it really is. Like that, that's kind of man in original justice. Well, one small last thing, you mm -hmm. use the word amara. Right. Um, I think that was kind of like a catch all for to existence to be good. Um, well, it, the, uh, well, that's just the Latin for, yeah, it, we talk about the Imago Dei in the Christian tradition, just man is the image of God. You know, that from the first chapter. I mean, the first chapter. I'm just curious. It's, it's, Right before the flood, I don't think I don't know if God would have said, "Yes, this is good." To name that's a, I mean, that's a tough question. Um, Aquinas would say, uh, "Yes." Why does he destroy it? Uh, not because it becomes inherently evil, but because the good that it that does exist in man being in the image of God, he he completely perverts. You know by by turning his heart I mean, from, from God. And what happens when you turn your heart from God? You idolize creatures, uh, and, uh, and literally all hell breaks loose. <laughs> oh, past the end, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, thank you all. Appreciate it. Oh, uh, maybe we can chat after. All right. Okay. All right. And then you want to say something? Right? To wrap things up? Yeah. So, you know,